All right, so picking up where we left off last time, we're gonna jump right into the applied visual design section of Free Code Camp. In the last video, I completed the basic CSS and there's also a video on the basic HTML. As you can see, here's my progress. Applied visual design is gonna cover a lot of stuff and it's one of the longer uh, sections of curriculum in the whole responsive web design certification of free code camp. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and just jump right into the introduction to applied visual design challenges. So uh, let's see what it has here. Visual design and web development is a broad topic. It combines typography, color theory, graphics, animation, and page layout to help deliver a site's message. The definition of good design is a well-discussed subject with many books on the theme. At a basic level, most web content provides a user with information. The visual design of a page can influence its presentation to a user's experience. In web development, HTML gives structure and semantics to a page's content and CSS controls the layout and appearance of it. This section covers some of the basic tools developers use to create their own visual designs. Let's go to the first lesson. All right. What do we have? Let's see, create visual balance using text aligned property. This section of the curriculum focuses on applied visual design. The first group of challenges builds on a given card layout to show a number of core principles. Text is often a large part of web content. CSS has several options on how to align it with the text aligned property. Text align justify causes all lines of text except the last line to meet the left and the right edges of the line box. Text align center centers the text, text align right, right aligns the text, and text align left, the default aligns the text to the left. That's what you're used to seeing most of the time. Align the H4 tag text, which says Google, to the center and then justify the paragraph which contains information about how Google was founded. All right, so. What do we have? So it wants, so it wants the H4 to be center. So we'll do text align center. And that should move that to the center. Did I, oh. Oh, I got to spell it right if I want that to work. And then the P tag is going to be text ah, align. And what was that? Justify. And now you'll see that that spaces out those letters a little bit more. You don't often use justify. It works in some cases, but sometimes it'll make your text look kind of funny. And it's better to just align stuff to the left because that's more natural to the human eye. People read from left to right. Um, there are cases for it, but we'll just follow the curriculum and see what they have us do. So let's run the test and that should pass. Cool. Let's go to the next one. All right. Uh, adjust the width of an element using the width property. I can't say width, width. Uh, if you, uh, you can specify the width of an element using width property in CSS. Values can be given a relative length unit such as M, absolute length such as pixels or PX, uh, as, uh, or as a percentage of its containing parent element. Here's an example that changes the width of an image to 220 pixels. Uh, add the width property to the entire card and set it to absolute value of 245 pixels. Uh, use the full card class. So here we go. They got a nice little space ready for us there. And what they say, 245, that should do it. Now you see here it made that a little bit smaller and it will always take up 245 pixels no matter what. So run the test and that passes. All right, next one here. Adjust the height of an element using the height property. You can specify the height of an element using the height property in CSS similar to the width property. Here's an example that changes the height of an image to 20 pixels. Add height property to the H4 tag and set it to 25 pixels. All right, so, and then what was it? It wanted to be 25 pixels. And then run the test. All right. Uh, use the strong tag to make text bold. To make text bold, you can use the strong tag. This is often used to draw attention to text and symbolizes the, that it is important. With the strong tag, the browser applies CSS font weight bold to the element. Wrap strong tag around Stanford University inside the P tag. Do not include the period. Okay, so... 
Okay, so it doesn't want the period to be bolded inside a Stanford University. You can also use B for bold, but it's better practice to use strong because it, it's actually more screen reader friendly. I don't know if they're gonna cover that here in the accessibility section, so I'm not gonna go too into that, but strong is better than the B tag. Um, but both will make them bold. Uh, so where is it? Stanford University, where is it? Why can't I see it? Okay, so it wants this to be strong, and then we'll close that, and it doesn't want the period, so we'll close it off here. That should do it. Now you'll see that Stanford University is bolded and the period is not, and this should pass. All right, breezing right through it, almost at 10%. All right, use the U tag to underline text. To underline text, you can use the U tag. This is often used to signify that a section of the text is important or something to remember. With the U tag, the browser applies CSS of text decoration underline to the element. Wrap the U tag around the PhD students. Uh, try to avoid using the U tag when you could to conf uh, because it could confuse it as a link or for a link. Anchor tags also have a default underline. Yeah, but anchor tags also have the default color that's usually blue and when it's clicked, it's purple. But I do get what they're saying because underlining stuff does make it look like a link here because they made the the link the same color. So what am I wrapping up here? PhD students is what we're gonna be putting a U tag around. So we're gonna go U and then here, we'll close that off. I didn't mean to add that. And now you can see PhD students has an underline up here. Let's run that test and breezing right through this. All right, use the M tag to italicize text. To emphasize text, you can use the M tag. This displays text italicized. Uh, as the browser applies CSS font style italic to the element, wrap M tags around the contents of the paragraph tag to give it emphasis. So we're gonna just right here, we're gonna do M, close that off, and it wants the whole P tag and here. And then this should work, there you go. See, and uh, if, you don't, if you don't see it, you can see here everything is italic now within that P tag. All right, on to the next one. All right, use the S tag to strike through text. To strike through text, which is when a horizontal line cuts across the characters, you can use an S tag. It shows that a section of text is no longer valid. With the S tag, the browser applies the CSS of text decoration line through to the element. Wrap the S tag around Google inside the H4 tag and then add the word alphabet beside it. All right, uh, where is it? Here we're gonna, so in here we're gonna do S around Google and then we're gonna do an S to close that and then we're gonna do alphabet beside it and we'll give it a little space for some, some cushion there, and there you go. See, easy as that. And you can see Google here has a line through it now. All right, on to the next one. All right, next one is create a horizontal line using the HR element. Uh, HR, uh, you can use the HR tag to add a horizontal line across the width of its containing element. This can be used to define and change a change in topic or visual separation of groups of content. Add an HR tag underneath the H4, which contains the card. HR is self-closing, so we don't need to add a closing tag to this. We can simply just go right here. Look at that, they're, they're, even, they're even telling us where they want it. So just HR there and easy peasy. Now you can see a nice little horizontal row there. Uh, all right. Although this section is longer, it seems like the, the questions and the challenges are a little bit shorter so maybe it might balance out and this video won't have to go over an hour and a half all right let's see what's the next one adjust the background color property of text instead of adjusting your overall background or the color of the text to make the foreground easily readable you can add a background color to the element holding the text you want to emphasize this challenge uses the rgba instead of the hex codes or the normal rgb 
So RGBA stands for red, green, blue, and alpha level of opacity. That means that you can make it a little bit more transparent if you like using the A uh, portion of this. So the RGB values range from zero to 255. If you watch the uh, CSS section uh, and challenges, then you would know that. If you didn't, go back and watch it. I'll, I'll remember to link it somewhere in this video. Uh, let's see, the alpha value can range from one, which is fully opaque, or a solid color to zero, which is fully transparent or clear. RGBA is great use case as it allows you to adjust the opacity. This means you don't have to have a completely block out. You don't have to completely block out the background. You'll use background color RGBA 4545.1 one so we're just going to copy that because i am not going to type all that for this challenge it produces a dark gray color that is nearly transparent given the low opacity value of 0 0.1 to make the text stand out more adjust the background color of the h4 element with the given rgba value so also re uh, for the h4 remove the height property and add padding of 10 pixels all right so it wants us to remove height property and then we're going to do padding uh, 10, ah, 10 pixels, and then uh, what was that RGBA? So we'll do background color, and then just paste that RGBA value and close that out. And then now you can see it has this nice little, little background there. If you wanted to play with this and see how dark it could get, if you made that a one, you see how dark that is, so we do 0.1 and zero in front of it, which uh, is better and more common practice to include the zero there. So we'll run the test and there we go. Easy peasy. Also, again, like I'm saying in all these videos, if there's anything that I can do to improve these videos and make them better to watch or easier to watch or more interactive, please let me know in the comments. If you're enjoying this video and you're finding value in it, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more videos like this and just general tips and tricks and motivation on learning how to code and becoming a self-taught programmer and web developer. All right, enough of that. Let's, uh, let's go to the next one. Adjust the size of a header versus a paragraph tag. The font size of the header tag H1 through H6 should generally be larger than the font size of paragraph tags. This makes it easier for the user to visually understand the layout and level of importance of everything on the page. You use the font size property to adjust the size of the text in an element. To, to make the heading significantly larger than the paragraph tag, use font size H4 to 27 pixels. So. Right here, we're gonna go font size, oh, too many, and 27 pixels, and that should be it, and then boom, see how big that is there. All right, it's so big. All right, uh, this card's starting to look look kinda, kinda decent now with all these little, uh, you know, styles that we're adding to it. All right, uh, next one, add a box shadow to a card element a uh, card-like element. Box shadow property applies one or more shadows to an element. The box shadow property takes values for offset X, how far to push the shadow horizontally from the element, offset Y, how far to push the shadow vertically from the element, blur radius, spread radius, and color in that order. The blur radius and spread radius values are optional. Multiple box shadows can be created by using commas to separate properties of each box shadow element. Here is an example of the CSS to create multiple shadows with some blur at mostly at mostly transparent black colors. All right, the element now has an ID of thumbnail with the selector, with this selector use the example CSS values above to place in the box shadow. All right, so it's just telling us to basically copy this and then add it to the ID selector that they gave, which is a thumbnail. I'm not very familiar with box shadow. If I had to add box shadow to something, I would probably have to Google this. Um, it's not something that, that I know off the top of my head. I've added shadows and box shadows to things before, but it's just not something that I use that often. So it would be something that I would have to Google. It looks like they don't have the selector already typed in for us. So it looks like we're gonna have to add it. Now remember with IDs, you use the hash and not a period. Periods are for classes. And then what was it, thumbnail? 
and curly brackets and then we should be able to just paste what it gave us and oh look at look at that look how nice that shadow is it really just makes it pop off the page it makes it look like an actual card and that's that's it to just make that look so much nicer it's that one line of css and it gives it that shadow which gives it almost a little 3d like effect so there you go which um you know flat design i don't know they don't use too too many shadows but i do enjoy shadows insert on certain elements and stuff so it just depends on how you're designing your pages all right what's the next one decrease the opacity of an element opacity property in css is used to adjust the opacity or conversely the transparency ah, i can't i can't speak i can't read transparency of an item a value of one is opaque, which isn't transparent at all. A value of 0 0.5 is half see-through and a value of zero is completely transparent. They kind of mentioned that in uh, the you know challenge before the last, I think. So the value given will apply to the entire element, whether it is an image with some transparency or the foreground and background colors of a block of text. Set opacity to the anchor tags to 0 0.7 using links class to select them. All right, so here's the links class. Here we're just gonna do opacity. And then what was it? Uh, dot seven, well, not, not seven, dot seven. All right, and then now you can, it's, you can barely see it. Um, let's, let's make it one so it's really, really, it's, now you see how, how they're almost gone, but the uh, dot seven is, just a little bit lighter than black so you never want to make your text just pure black for the most part it's you always want to go like a step under black it's easier to read it's that's just like a ux ui thing um pure black text is just kind of hard on the eyes uh also pure white too that's just little extra tidbits of information that come from me learning some principles of design all right let's move on use the text uh, transform property to make text uppercase. Text transform property in CSS is used to change the appearance of text. It's a convenient way to make sure that text on a web page appears consistently without having to change the text content of the actual HTML elements. The following table shows how different text transform values change the example text transform me. All right. So lowercase makes everything lowercase, uppercase makes everything uppercase. Capitalized will make the first letter of everything capitalized. Initial is the default value. Inherit will uh, use the text transform value of the parent element. Uh, I mentioned that in the HTML section, um, you're going to have to get used to things having like a family tree structure in, in code. You're often referencing uh, siblings and parents, grandchildren, all that kind of stuff in HTML, in objects, in arrays. And it's, it's just common terminology. So just get used to referring to everything as, as a family member. Uh, and then none would be the uh, default use the original text. So transform the text of the H4 to be uppercase with text transform. So here we're gonna do text uh, transform. And what did it want? It wanted uppercase, so uppercase. And now we should see, there it is. Alphabet is in nice uppercase letters. All right, look at that, quarter of the way done. We're almost there, everybody. Let's see, set the font size for multiple heading elements. Font size property is used to specify how large the text of a given element. This rule can be used for multiple elements to create visual consistency of text on a page. In this challenge, you will set the values for all H1 through H6 tags to balance the heading sizes. All right, all right. So, all right, this one, this one's not too hard. It's just a bunch of a boilerplate that we're gonna have to type here. So then they want H1, we're gonna, I'm gonna type it all out. I'm not gonna copy and paste too much on this one unless it's just stuff that's just too long to type. So I'm actually gonna, I, I just lied. I'm gonna take, take back what I just said. I am gonna copy and paste <laughs> once I'm done typing the first one out because I'm not just gonna keep typing this. That would be ridiculous. But you can type it if you want the muscle memory. I totally get it. So now you can see that it's changing the size there. I don't like that indentation, but whatever. I'm gonna just go ahead and use my shortcut, which is Shift, Alt, or Option, depending on if you're using Mac or Windows, and then down, and I'm gonna do that 
five times and then I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna change this one to H2 and then this value to, what was it, 52? Is that what it wants? Yeah, and then we're gonna make this one H3 and then we're gonna change this value to 40 and then we're gonna go with this one to H4 and we're gonna change this value to 32, is that what I wanted, 32? 32 and then H5, we're gonna do 21. And then last but not least, H6 is going to be 14. Oh, 14. All right, and there you go. Now we sized all those differently. I'm not going to, uh, you know what, I'm going to clean this up just because I, I, I can't just leave it like that. I would space all this stuff out, but it's going to do it for me once I complete this. It's just I'm kind of a little OCD when it comes to that stuff. But for the sake of keeping this moving, we're just gonna go ahead and, and leave that like that. And oh, look, it didn't put spaces between that. How, huh, I guess I'll have to live with it. All right, set the font weight for multiple heading elements. You set the font size of each heading tag in the last challenge. Here you'll adjust the font weight. The font weight property sets how thick or thin characters are in a section of text. F set the font weight uh, to the H1 to 800. All right, so we're just gonna type this out, font weight, and then what do we want? 800, and then semicolon, and then we're just gonna we're just gonna copy this, and we're just gonna paste it into the next one, and then it wants this one to be 600, um, and then we're just gonna keep copying and pasting. Oh, I can't, I can't live like that. Oh, I can't live like that either. All right, so what's this one gonna be? Uh, 500. And then that one's four. And we're just gonna keep going down the list here, nice and easy. Again, you don't have to type this stuff out. You're seeing me copy and paste it. The truth is you're gonna copy and paste a lot of stuff. Um, you don't have to memorize this stuff. It's, you know, if you want to, you can try. There's not much value in memorization of, of these kind of things because honestly, even if you memorize it, you're probably going to forget it when it comes time to use it and you're still going to have to Google it. So it's better to not waste a bunch of time trying to memorize this stuff. Just keep moving forward and try to apply this stuff when you go to actually build your own projects and put this into practice rather than spending a bunch of time trying to memorize font weight value or font size value. I, I, I tried to memorize this stuff when I was learning and now I don't try to memorize anything. Anything that I do know by memorization is because of muscle memory and having to use it so often and having to Google it so many times that I finally have it memorized or remember it because I use it that often. But there's so much stuff that I don't know and that's why you just Google everything. Don't waste a bunch of time memorizing stuff. You'll, you'll learn that when you actually start building stuff. All right, next one. Let's see here. We got uh, set the font size of the paragraph tag. All right, more font size. The font size property in CSS is not limited to headings. It can be applied to any element containing text. Change the value of the font size property in the paragraph tag to 16. All right, you can see it's so itty bitty. It's so hard to read. I can, I can barely see that. So let's just make that 16. And there you have it. See, nice and easy. All right, 31%. We're, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Nice. Let's go to the next one. So let's uh, set the line height of paragraphs. All right, CSS offers the line height property to change the height of each line in a block of text. As the name suggests, it changes the amount of vertical space that each line of text gets. Add a line height property to the P tag that sets it to 25 pixels. That is a ridiculously large line height, but I'm assuming that they're doing it just for uh, <laughs> example purposes here and not because they, they really want you to have 25 pixels line height because, oh, I guess, oh, that's right, because you also do it without that and that's, okay. So line height, I, I don't think normally uses pixels. I think you wanna stay away from using pixels if I'm not mistaken, I think this is just to teach you the fundamentals because line height is usually like 1.6 is usually like a good line height is normally what people set it to because it's more relative. If you use the pixels, you're setting that to a hard value of 25 pixels. And normally best practice is to use line height like this and not in pixels, but for what they're teaching us, we're gonna do it in pixels and we're gonna run the test and that pass. So let's see. 
All right, adjust the hover state of an anchor tag. In this challenge, we will touch on the usage of pseudo classes. A pseudo class is a keyword that can be added to selectors in order to select a specific state of the element. For example, the styling of an anchor tag can be changed for its hover state using the hover pseudo class selector. Here's the CSS to change the color of an anchor tag to red during the hover state. The code editor has a CSS rule to style the A tag blocks, add a rule so that you can use uh, hover over the A tag to color it. So uh, we're gonna, it wants us to add another one, right? All right, so, so we're gonna do hover, hover, and then we're gonna go, what is it? What, what does it want? Blue, so we're gonna do color and then blue. And then now we can hover over that and ooh, look at that. See, it turns blue when you hover on it. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're learning how to make things do stuff on the page, which is pretty cool. And you can do a lot in CSS now. Um, you know, we've, we've CSS has come a long way. There's animations in CSS. Back in the day, you need a JavaScript for a lot of stuff that now CSS can, can do and handle and transitions and all kinds of crazy stuff that I'm not really good at, but I know I know of it and I know people that are really good at it. I'm, I'm kind of getting away from UI development and HTML and CSS and I'm trying to be more of a full stack engineer, back end, front end, full stack and not so much UI development, although the line is blurred with front end developers and UI development, but anyone that knows the difference will understand what I'm talking about. There, There is a difference there, but if you're trying to be a front end developer, don't worry, this stuff is stuff that you need to learn. Even the basics will get you a long way. And if you decide to go more into the moving data around with the front end rather than moving the UI around with the front end, then that will mean that you'll just need to learn more JavaScript at that point. But that, I, I digress, let's get back to it. Change an element's relative position. CSS treats each HTML element as its own box. I mentioned this when we were learning about the HTML stuff and, and some of the CSS stuff. Everything on a web page is a box box model, look that up and you'll probably get quizzed on it when you go to job interviews for front end roles because it's a common question that they ask to explain the box model. And there you go, Blo uh, uh, it even mentions it here, the box model, box level items automatically start a new line, think headings, paragraphs and divs while inline items sit within surrounding content like images or spans, the default layout of elements in this way is called normal flow of a document, but CSS offers the position property to override that. When the position of an element is set to relative, that allows you to specify how CSS should move it relative to its current position in the normal flow of the page. It pairs with CSS offset properties left, right, top and bottom. These say how many pixels, percentages, or M's you should move them away from and where it's normally positioned. The following example moves a paragraph 10 pixels away from the bottom. Position relative bottom 10 px. All right, let's see here. Changing an element's position to, the rel to relative does not remove it from the normal flow. Other elements around it still behave as if it were to if it were in its default position. Note, positioning gives you a lot of flexibility and power over visual layout of a page. It's good to remember that no matter the position of elements, the underlying HTML markup should be organized and make sense when read from top to bottom. This is how users with visual impairments who rely on assistive devices like screen readers access your content. We gotta keep the web accessible to people of all shapes and sizes with disabilities or not, it's very important that you learn some accessibilities and you make your websites accessible so everyone can use it because not everyone has the capability of being able to use a mouse, not everyone has the capability of being able to see a screen, and these are just things that you, you should know about and they they try to tell you about that here and they have sections in Free Code Camp that go more into that that we will cover in this series, but not yet. They're just kind of dipping our toes in the water by letting us know of these things now. Change the position of the H2 to relative and use CSS offset to move its to move it five, 15 pixels away from the top where it sits in its normal flow. Notice there is no impact to the positions of the surrounding H1. All right, so the H2, 
what did it want to do? It wanted position relative. Uh, I can't type. And then what is it? It wants the top 15 pixels. see how that moved a tiny bit you might not see it but it moved this it moved this guy just a little bit here I'm gonna erase it so you can see and then you see how it moves back up and now I'm gonna put that back and it moves back down and that's what that did and there we go all right I feel like I'm slowing down a little bit I'm gonna try to speed it up a little I don't want to I don't want to get too too far off into tangents covering stuff that may be beyond the scope of this and maybe a little bit beyond the skill level of a lot of people that may be watching this not trying to down talk anyone I just don't want to overwhelm anyone with too much knowledge that they just not may not be understanding at this point I'm assuming if you're on this course if you're on this uh, curriculum for free code camp if you're watching this video I'm gonna assume that you are a beginner so just take some of the stuff that I say lightly maybe jot it down for some extra homework but it's not anything that you need to overwhelm yourself with right now let's move on all right Move a relatively positioned element with CSS offset. CSS offset of top, bottom, left, or right. Tell the browser how far an offset of an item relative to where it should sit in the normal flow of the document. You're offsetting an element away from a given spot, which moves the element away from the refer reference side, effectively the opposite direction. As you saw in the last challenge, using top moved it downward, uh, likewise, using left will move it to the right. Use CSS offset to move the H2 pixels to the right and 10 pixels up. So if we want to move it to the right, we have to go left. That's what it just kind of, they kind of worded it tricky to kind of trick you on this. And then if we want it to move up, we have to offset it on the bottom. And that should do it. See, I'm sure that this one would get uh, some people stuck because they, they put right on there and then you if, if you didn't read that and you didn't understand it, you would put right and then it would mess you all up and you'd be like, I don't know what's wrong here. So lock an element to its parent with absolute positioning. All right, the next option for CSS position property is absolute, which locks the element in place relative to its parent container. Unlike the relative position, this removes the element from the normal flow of the document. So surrounding the items will ignore it. The CSS properties, top or bottom or left or right, are used to adjust the position. Uh, one nuance with absolute positioning is that it will lock, it will be locked relative to its closest position ancestor. Again, there goes that family referencing of of ancestor and family trees and whatnot. So you'll you'll be you'll get used to that. If you if you forgot to add if you forget to add a position rule to the parent, this typically is done with using position relative. The browser will keep looking up the chain and ultimately defaulting it to the body tag. So it'll keep looking for its ancestor until it finds a position. Lock the search bar element to the top right of its section parent by declaring its position as absolute. Give it top and right offsets of 50 pixels each. So we're gonna do position ab, ab, absolute. And then we're gonna go, what is it? Uh, what did it say? Top and right. So we're gonna go top. What was it? 50 pixels. And then we're gonna go right. 50 pixels. And then that should do it. All right. There we go. Nice and easy. All right, halfway there. Lock an element to the browser window with the fixed position. All right, next, the next layout scheme that CSS offers is the fixed position, which is a type of absolute positioning that locks an element relative to the browser window. Similar to absolute positioning, it's used with CSS offset properties and also removes the element from the normal flow of the document. Other items no longer realize where it's positioned, which may require some layout adjustments elsewhere. One key difference between fixed and absolute position is that an element with a fixed position will not move when a user scrolls. This is uh, often used with like menu bar, menu bars, and and uh, you know uh, headings and uh, top top rows that 
web pages want to have there all the time. Uh, the navigation bar in the code is labeled with the ID nav bar, change its position to fixed and offset it to 10 pixels from the top and 10 pixels or zero pixels, sorry, offset it zero pixels from the top and zero pixels from the left. After you have added the code, scroll the preview screen to see how the nav bar stays in place. All right, so we're gonna do position. I cannot spell position and fixed. And then what was it? Uh, top uh, zero and, yeah, and you can do zero for to represent zero um, and you can uh, you don't have to put pixels on it it'll default it to just zero um, that's normal you don't if you're saying zero you can just put zero you can put pixels also it doesn't make a difference and then now you can see it's nice and fixed up there so that's that's how to get a nav bar or a heading or a menu bar stuck at the top all right, let's move on. 42%, I thought we were closer to 50. All right, push elements left or right with the float property. Uh, floats are kind of old school. Uh, Flexbox kind of removes a lot of the need for floats and whatnot, but they're covering it here because it's good to know. You, if you work in a big enough code base that has code that's old enough and you'll find floats and they're a pain in the you know what to work with, but we're gonna cover them here. Next positioning tool does not actually use position, but sets the float property of an element. Floating elements are removed from the normal flow of a document and pushed to either side, left or right, of their containing parent element. It is commonly used with the width property to specify how much horizontal space to be floated, the floated elements requires. Ah, the given markup would work well with uh, as two column layout. With the section and a side, the elements next to each other give the left ID an item of float left and the right ID an item of float right. All right, easy peasy. So we're gonna go float left and then that one's gonna stay where it's at because um, it was probably already there. And then we're gonna go right, and this one you should see move to the right. And there you go, look at that, beautiful. All right. Change the position of overlapping elements with Z index. Ah, Z index, okay. So let's see, when elements are positioned overlap uh, using position absolute, relative, fixed, sticky, the element coming later in the HTML markup by default appear on the top of the other element. And however, the Z index property can specify the order of how elements are stacked on top of one another. It must be an integer, a whole number, not a decimal, and higher values for Z index properties of an element move it higher on the stack than those with lower values. Add Z index property, to the element with the case name first and the in the rectangle and set the value to two so it covers the other element's blue rectangle. So this one's first, we're gonna go Z index. And if you were wondering why I kind of said uh, Z index at the beginning of this, is because if, if you work in a, in a big enough code base where um, CSS is not properly structured and and just not done right you'll see a lot of the times you'll have z index you know like one and then two and then a hundred and then a thousand and then a thousand and one and a thousand two and then nine nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine and it's just it gets ridiculous so that's kind of why I, I gave a big oof at the beginning of that uh when i saw z index uh, center an element horizontally using the margin property. Another positioning technique to center a block element horizontally. One way to do this is to set its margin to a value of auto. This method also works for images too. Images are inline elements by default but can be changed to block elements when you set display property to block. Center the div on the page by adding the margin property value of auto. All right, this is nice and easy. So we just do margin. And then auto, and then that should be it. Yep, and now it's nice and centered there. Okay. Still not halfway through. Wow. All right, learn about complementary colors. Color theory and its impact on design is a deep topic and only the basics are covered in the following challenges. On a website, color can draw attention to content 
evoke emotions or create visual harmony. Using different combinations of colors can really change the look of a website and a lot of thought can go into picking a color palette that works with your content. The color wheel is useful to visualize how colors relate to each other. It's a circle where similar hues are neighbors and different hues are further apart. Uh, when two colors are opposite of the wheel, they are called complementary colors. They have characteristics that if combined, they cancel each other out and create a gray color. However, when placed side by side, these colors appear more vibrant and produce a strong visual contrast. Color theory, it's really cool. Um, shout out to my buddy Enoch, who uh, I had on an interview, who uh, taught me all about that stuff when I was first uh, at my first job. Um, but it's, it's pretty cool if you wanna learn more about color theory. That's a little extra homework if you really like UI and the front end side of you know building this stuff and making things look pretty. Learning color theory is, is good to know. All right, some examples of complementary colors in their hex codes are red and K. K, Kai, I don't know how to say that. Green and magenta, blue and yellow. Uh, this different than the, out, than the outdated RY, RYB color model that many of us thought were taught in school, different primary and complementary colors, mo modern color theory, additive RGB model and on a computer screen, subtractive Y. This is a bunch of stuff that I just don't understand. It has uh, more information here that you can read about it if you want. Let's move on to the challenge. Uh, real quick, let's read this note. For all color challenges, using color can be a powerful way to add visual interest on a page. However, color alone should not be used in the only way to convey important information because usual, users with visual impairments may not understand the content. Uh, this, this will be covered more in the applied accessibility. Again, they really, they touch on this a lot and it's really important to know somebody who's colorblind will have a hard time seeing certain colors. If you use really crazy colors, it just makes it hard to see even if you're not colorblind. So just keep those things in mind. Change the color background property of the blue and yellow classes to their respective colors. Notice now that the background, uh, that the colors look different from each other than they compared against the white background. So what's the same blue? It just wants this to be blue. So we'll just do blue, and then this wants this one to be yellow, yellow, and yeah, look at that. See how hard that yellow is to look at um, against the white background? That's that's a perfect example of colors that should not be uh, used with each other. That yellow on white is just, it hurts my eyes to even look at it. Right. Okay, let's learn about tertiary colors. Computer monitors and device screens create different colors by combining amounts of red, green, and blue light. This is known as RGB additive color model in modern color theory. Red, green, blue are called primary colors. Mixing two primary colors creates the secondary color. Cyan, I had to Google that to pronounce it right because I butchered it the last the last lesson. So cyan is uh, green and blue. Magenta is red and blue and yellow is red and green. You saw these colors in the complementary colors challenge. This secondary colors happens to be uh, the complement color to the primary color not used in their creation and are opposite to that primary color on the color wheel. For example, magenta is made of red and blue and it is the complement to green. Tertiary colors are the result of combining a primary color with one of its secondary color neighbors. For example, within the RGB color model, red primary and yellow secondary make orange. Uh, this adds six more colors to a simple color wheel for a total of 12. There are a various methods of selecting different colors that result in har harmonious combination in design. Uh, harmonious, harmonious. I think it's harmonious. Combination in design. One example that can use tertiary colors is called the split complementary color scheme. This scheme starts with the base color, then pairs it with the two colors that are adjacent to its complement. The three colors provide strong visual contrast in a design, but are more subtle than using two complementary colors. Here are three colors created using the split complement scheme. Uh, we have orange, cyan, and raspberry. Change the background color property of the orange, cyan, and raspberry classes to their respected colors. Uh, we might as well just use the hex values here. So this one's pretty easy. So we want orange. We're going to change orange there. Uh, what's this? Cyan. 
I'm really glad I learned how to pronounce that, by the way. And if I butcher some words, I'm trying to read as fast as I can. And honestly, um, yeah, I'm just I'm just gonna screw up a lot of words. I apologize. Feel free to correct me in the comments, and you know, just don't be a jerk about it. <laughs> all right, there you go. That changed all the colors, and those really do look nice. It looks harsh on the white background, but they look nice overall. All right, let's see what we got here. Adjust the colors of various elements to complementary colors. The complementary colors challenge showed that opposite colors in the color wheel can make each other appear more vibrant when placed side by side. However, strong visual contrast can be jarring if it's overused on a website and can sometimes make text harder to read if it's placed on a complementary color background. In practice, one of the colors is usually dominant and the complement is used to bring visual attention to certain content on the page. This page will use a shade of teal as the dominant color and its orange uh, complement to visually highlight the sign up buttons. Change the background color of both header and footer from black to teal and then change the H2 color to teal as well. Finally change the background color of the button to orange. Okay, so uh, change the background color of the header and the footer to teal. So it gave us this teal here and we wanna change the header and footer. So let's copy that. Let's look for header here. I'll drop that there and then let's look for footer here. All right, now that's, that's already looking better. And then the H2 color to teal as well. And then the button, what did it want? The button just to orange, is that what it said? Orange. And then that should be it. Ah, what did I miss? Oh, it wants it. It wants it to use the hex value. My bad. Uh, totally did not like that. There you go. So use the hex value on that one. Adjust the hue of a color. Colors have several characteristics, including hue, saturation, and lightness. CSS3 introduces the HSL property as an alternative way to pick a color by directly stating these characteristics. If you picture a spectrum of colors, starting with red on the left, moving through green in the middle and blue on the right, the hue is where a color fits along this line. In HSL property, hue uses a color wheel concept instead of spectrum, where the angle of the color on the circle is given a value between zero and 360. Saturation is the amount of gray in a color. A fully saturated color has no gray in it and a minimally saturated color is almost completely gray. This is given as a percentage with 100% being fully saturated. Lightness is the amount of white or black in a color. A percentage is given ranging from 0% black to 100% white where 50% is the normal color. Here are a few examples of using HSL uh, with fully saturated normal lightness colors. Uh, here you go. All right, so those are the normal colors with fully saturated and normal lightness. What is the challenge? Let's see. Change the background color of each div element based on the class names, green, cyan, blue, using HSL. There should be full saturation and normal lightness. So we got the colors here. We're just gonna copy this. So we got, we're gonna do green here. That one's green, uh, cyan here, copy that. And then what was it, blue? Then we're gonna go with blue right there. All right, copy that, and then blue right there. All right, that should do it. There you go. All right, let's see, what's the next one? Adjust the tone of a color. The HSL option in CSS also makes it easy to adjust the tone of a color. Mixing white with a pure hue creates a tint of color and adding black will make a shade. Alternatively, a tone is produced by adding gray or by both tinting and shading. Recall that the S and the L of HSL 
uh, stand for saturation and light, uh, lightness, respectively. And the saturation percentage changes the amount of gray and the lightness determines how much white or black is in the color. This is useful when you have a hue base you like but need different variations of it. All elements have a default background color of transparent. Our nav element currently appears to have cyan background uh, because the element behind it has a background color set to cyan. Uh, add the background color to the nav element so it is uses the same cyan hue but is 80% saturation and 25% lightness. So, so add a background color to the nav. So it's basically gonna use the same exact thing here. So we can just copy this, dump that in the nav. And then what was the percentage? So we want 80% saturation. And then what was it? 25% lightness. There you go. And there you go. And now, even though it's the same exact color, it uses that lightness and saturation to separate it and helps you kind of keep the same palette going with your colors and that's that's a pretty cool way to use the same color but have it stand out or have certain areas stand out which is pretty neat that they teach this this is a lot of stuff that um they didn't have when i first did free code camp a lot of this stuff is is newer i did free code camp like geez four years ago so some of some of this stuff i i didn't go through and even though i had completed some of these sections like the html and whatnot many of these things have be, been added throughout you know the last few years and it's pretty nice that i'm going through it because i'm learning a little bit too all right create a gradual css linear gradient applying a color on html elements is not limited to one flat hue css provides the ability to use color transitions otherwise known as gradients on elements this is access through the background property uh, linear gradient function. Here's a linear, or here's is the general syntax. Background, linear gradient, gradient direction, first color, second color, and color three, and then dot, dot, dot. What's the dot, dot, dot mean? All right, the first argument specifies the direction from which the color transition starts. It can be stated as a degree where it's 90 degrees uh, makes a horizontal gradient from left to right and 45 is angled like a backslash. Uh, the following arguments specify the order of colors using the gradient. So example, linear gradient, 90 degree, red, yellow, and RGB, uh, whatever that RGB is. Use linear gradient for the divs element background and set it from a direction of 35 degrees and change the color from CFF to FCCC. All right, so we're gonna do linear i actually i don't know the syntax because i anytime i use like a, a gradient i'm usually like copying and pasting it from a website somewhere and it's it's not stuff that i'm used to using so i forgot to add background color to the beginning of this but i'm just gonna do this part first and go back uh, because I'm already here and why not? I hope it doesn't confuse you. That's why I am making sure to mention that I am doing that because right now what I have written on the screen is not gonna work because I did not specify where I'm actually trying to add this gradient. So we're just gonna do background and then colon and then I gotta go to the end of that and add a semicolon. Nope, not there, there. And then look at that. that, that looks pretty nice, doesn't it? Yeah, I like gradients, gradients are pretty cool. All right, 60%, look at that, we're, we're getting there people, we're getting there. All right, let's see. Use a CSS linear gradient to create a striped element. The repeating linear gradient function is very similar to linear gradient. Uh, the major difference is that it repeats the specified gradient pattern, repeating linear gradient, accepts a variety of values, but for simplicity, you will work with an angle value and color stop values in this challenge. The angle value is the direction of the gradient. Color stops are like with values that mark where the transition takes place and are given with a percentage or a number of pixels. In the example demonstrated in the color uh, in the code editor, the gradient starts with the color yellow at zero pixels, which blends into the second color blue at 40 pixels away from the start. Since the next color stop is almost at 40 pixels, the gradient immediately changes to the third color green, 
which it blends into the fourth color value red as that is 80 pixels away from the beginning of the gradient. I hope you followed all that because I went on autopilot reading it and I didn't understand that. So you might have to read that a few times over because I'm not gonna read it again. And it was it felt a little confusing, but let's see. For example, it helps you to think about the color stops and pairs every two color blends. So zero pixels yellow, blend blue, 40 pixels green, blend red, 80 pixels. If every two color step values are the same color, it's blending isn't noticeable because it's between the same color followed by a hard transition to the next color. So you end up with stripes, uh, making stripes by make stripes by changing the repeated linear gradient to use gradient angle of 45 degrees and then set the first two color stops to yellow. And finally the second stop to black. All right, let's see if I don't screw this up too bad. Uh, so we're going to do 45 degrees and then it says the first, two color stops to yellow, is that right? Uh, and the second two to black. All right, wish me luck. I don't, I don't even know if this is gonna work. I really, I really don't know. Ah, it did work. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad that worked because I, I never used that. So uh, create texture by adding a subtle pattern as a background image. One way to add texture and interest to the background and have it stand out more than uh, is to add a subtle, a subtle pattern. The key is balance as you don't want the background to stand out too much and take away from the foreground. The background property supports the URL function in order uh, to link an image and choose the texture or pattern. The link address is wrapped in quotes inside the parentheses. All right, this is really common for like hero uh, images and whatnot. So this is something you'll probably be using quite a bit. So we're going to use this URL that they provide us here. I'm going to copy that and then we're going to just put it right in the body section here and we're going to do background and we're going to do a uh, URL and then we're going to do parens and then quotes and then we're going to dump that in there and we should, and it's kind of hard to see on my screen. I don't know if, if you can see it on yours, but it's just kind of like a little, a little symmetrical looks like kind of like just twirly repeating patterns there. Um, but that was as simple as that. Let's move on to the next one. Use CSS to transform scale properties to change the size of an element. To change the scale of an element, CSS has the transform property along with its scale function. The following code example doubles the size of the paragraph elements on the page. Transform scale to increase the size of an element in the ID of ball two to 1.5 times its original size. So ball two, we're just gonna change, oh, no, 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 no. See, I'm not even paying attention here. So we're gonna transform and we're gonna do scale. And then what was it? Uh, 1.5, 1.5, and then that should do it. And then now you can see that this ball is a little bit bigger than that ball. Ah, what did I miss? Ball two scale. Transform the property of ball two. Oh, I didn't close it out. See that th I totally missed that, and that would break um, your CSS. If if you did that, um, you would probably have issues, and a linter would have caught that. But this didn't because they don't have linter set up. Because you need to catch these mistakes as you're learning. So that's. That was good that we just went through that. All right, use the CSS transform scale property to scale an element on hover. The transform property has a variety of functions that lets you scale, move, rotate, and skew, etc. Your elements, uh, I should have said that as one sentence, but I, that comma messed me up. When you use pseudo classes such as hover that specify a certain state of an element, the transform property can easily add interactivity to your elements. Here's an example to scale, scale the paragraph element to 2.1 times its original size when you use hover on it. So here's the pseudo class that it's adding to the P tag right there, colon hover. Uh, applying transform to a div element will also affect its child elements. Good to know. That's inheritance from uh, CSS and that was covered in the basic CSS stuff. So if you haven't watched that, you probably should because this stuff is probably something that you don't know if you don't know any CSS. So this would be good to go back and watch that. Uh, add a Add a CSS rule for the hover state of the div and use the transform property to scale the div element to 1.1 times its original size on hover. 
All right, so we're just gonna add that here. We're gonna do div colon hover. We're gonna, and then what? It's just scale it to 1.1, that's all it wants. So we're gonna do transform and then scale and then 1.1. And we're not gonna forget the semicolon this time. And then now we hover and you see, you see that little hover effect there? That's pretty cool, right? Boom, boom, boom. All right, let's run that. Hey, we're getting there. All right, let's see if we can wrap this up here in a bit. Uh, use the CSS transform property skew x to skew an element along the x axis. The next function of the transform property is skew x, which skews the selected element along its x horizontal axis by a given degree. The following code skews a paragraph negative 32 degrees along its x-axis. Here's an example there. Skew the element of the ID bottom to 24 degrees along the x-axis. So uh, bottom, we're gonna do transform, and we're gonna do skew x, and it's case sensitive, so we wanna make sure we do that. And what was it, 24 degrees? So we're gonna do 24 DG, and then now you can see it's got that those cool little skews there. And let's not forget our semicolon. I'm, I'm slacking on the semicolon right now. That's pretty bad. Bad on my part. All right, use the transform property skew Y to skew it along the Y axis. So I'm assuming that this is gonna be the vertical axis, right? Since we just did X, that was horizontal. This is gonna be vertical. Given the skew X function skews it uh, to a given degree on the X uh, axis, it's no surprise that skew Y is gonna skew it on the vertical axis, the Y axis. Skew the element with the ID top to negative 10 on the Y axis. So top is here, we're gonna transform, and we're gonna, what was it, skew, capital Y, parens, and what did it want? Negative 10, negative 10 degrees, and we're not gonna forget our semicolon this time, and now look at that cool little uh, skew it's got there. Awesome, easy peasy, let's keep it moving. All right, let's see, let's see, use, oh wait, I was still reading the last one, my, my internet must be slow. Create a graphic using CSS. By manipulating different selectors and properties, you can make interesting shapes. One of the easier ones is to try a crescent moon shape. For this challenge, you will need to work with the box shadow property and set the shadow of an element along with the border radius property that controls the roundness of an element's corners. This sounds like, something that's way harder for me to do. And I actually do remember this challenge now. So I think I did do the applied visual design stuff. It's been so long. Uh, you will create a round transparent object with a crisp shadow that is slightly offset to the side. Uh, the shadow is actually going to be the moon shape you see. In order to create a round object, the border radius property should be set to a value of 50%. That was covered in the basic CSS stuff. So you may recall the earlier challenge of box shadow that takes an offset X, offset Y, blur radius, spread radius, and color value in that order. Blur radius and spread radius values are optional. Manipulate the square element in the editor to create a moon shape. First, change the background color to transparent. So here's the background color. We're gonna do transparent. All right, that's transparent now. And then the next one is gonna be then set the border radius property to 50%. So then we're gonna change this to 50%. All right, look look at that, it's, it's already there. Uh, and then what else? Finally, change the box shadow to offset X by 25, or what is that? Offset X by 25, offset Y to 10, blur radius to zero and spread radius to zero. So then we're gonna be changing this one to zero and then this one to zero. And then, yeah, we're gonna change that to uh, blue because that green is hideous and now it actually looks more like a moon. And there you go. All right, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. We're almost done, almost done. Uh, create a more complex shape using CSS and HTML. One of the most popular shapes in the world is the heart shape. In this challenge, you can create one using CSS, but first you will need to understand the before and after pseudo elements. All right, so now we're getting into pseudo elements and uh, they covered pseudo selectors earlier. Now we're getting into pseudo elements. The pseudo elements are used uh, to add something before and after a selected element. The following example of uh, dot dot before pseudo element is used to add a rectangle to, I'm sorry, colon colon before pseudo element is used to add a rectangle to an element 
with the class heart. So here's all the example text, uh, example code there. And then from the before and after pseudo elements to function properly, you must have a defined content property. This property is usually used to add things like a photo or text or so, uh, to the selected element. Uh, when the before or the after, after pseudo element are used to make shapes, the content property is still required but is set to empty string. And as you can see right here, uh, uh, let's see, set to empty string. In the above example, the element class heart has a before pseudo element that produces a yellow rectangle uh, with the height and width of 50 pixels and 70 pixels respectively. The This rectangle has round corners due to its 25% border radius and is positioned absolute at five pixels from the left and 50 ab uh, above the top element. Transform the element on the screen into the heart. In the heart after selector, change the background color to pink and the radius to 50. So here's the heart after pseudo element. And then it said, change this to 50. And then it wants it to be pink. And look, 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 it's, it's almost there. It's looking almost like a, a heart, kind of, not really. And then next, target the element with the heart. Uh, and just transform the property and use rotate to change that to negative 45. So, so you can see here, they're, they're giving us um, that that property is empty. It doesn't have anything there. So you would add it right here. And we're gonna transform with rotate, which I don't think they covered rotate, but it's similar to all the other transforms where you just have to add the property inside the parens there because it's a function and then now it's looking more like a heart so that's that and then finally in the heart before set its contents to an empty string where's our before so here again they're providing us the property you just need to add the empty string to it so then an empty string is usually defined with just quotes um, I, I don't think it cares if it's single quotes or double quotes. I'm used to using single quotes. HTML and CSS is probably better practice to use double quotes, so I'm just gonna do that there. Uh, and then that's it. Look, we got a cute little heart right there. Isn't that awesome? 75%, three quarters of the way done. We're almost there. Uh, learn how CSS keyframes and animation properties work. To animate an element, you need to know about the animation properties and the keyframes rule. The animation properties control how the animation should behave and the keyframes uh, rule controls what happens during the animation. There are eight animation properties in total. This challenge will keep it simple and cover two of the most important ones first. Animation name sets the name of the animation, which is later used by the at keyframes to tell the CSS which rules to use in with which animations. Animation duration sets the length of time for the animation. Keyframes is how to specify exactly what happens within the animation over the duration. This is done by giving CSS properties for specific frames during the animation with percentages ranging from zero to 100. If you compare this to a movie, the CSS properties for 0% is how the element displays the opening scene. The CSS property for 100% is how the element appears at the end right before the credits roll. Uh, uh, t -t 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 then CSS applies a magic to transition the element over the given duration and act out the scene. Here's an example to illustrate the usage of at keyframes in the animation properties. So here's your example here. You can see the, the, uh, the animation duration right here, three seconds. And then here's what it's doing during those keyframes. 0% is blue and then 100% is yellow. Let's see Let's see what else. Uh, for the element, uh, the element in the any ID, uh, the code snippet above sets the animation name to colorful and sets the animation duration to three seconds and the keyframe rules links the property. So it's basically just what I just said right now. You aren't limited to only beginning and end transitions. You can set properties of the element for any percentage between zero and 100. They're just giving this an example, but you can use any you know, any uh, percentages between that. Let's create an animation for the element with the ID rec uh, by setting the animation name to rainbow and the animation duration to four seconds. So, okay, so we're gonna do, what was it? I just, I'm gonna need the example because I don't really ever do this. So it's animation name, and what is it, rainbow, rainbow and, and then what was it? Animation duration. 
any uh, duration. And then what they want four seconds of so 4s. And then what's it saying to do the at keyframe? So at what is it key frames? And what is it? Uh, keyframes rule set the background color. So, okay, so then now we have to give it the name. So we want rain uh, bow. I, I'm misspelling rainbow, aren't I? <laughs> no, I'm not. I, it's getting late and words are just not making sense anymore and nothing looks right on the screen to me. So please disregard that. I'm a little delirious and we'll just continue this right now. So next, uh, what is it? Background color beginning animation to... So then 0% is going to be, what is it, blue? Uh, so. And then uh, let's just copy this. And I use my shortcut again. I mentioned that in a few videos now, you could just copy and paste that. And then what did it want that to be? 50% uh, is going to be green. So we're going to do 50 is green. And then finally, the last one is going to be yellow. So let's change that to 100. And then this is going to be yellow. And then that should be it. I'm not seeing an animation, though. What did I do wrong? I did something wrong here. Doesn't seem like I did anything wrong. I, I, I'm not seeing an animation, but I guess it, it, it liked it enough, so my code wasn't wrong. Uh, let's see, let's use CSS animation to change the hover state of a button. You can use CSS keyframes to change the color of a button in its hover state. Here's an example of changing the width of an image on hover. So there you have the pseudo selector hover and the, the animation name, which you match up here with the keyframe, and then the duration of the animation, and then your width. I might have not seen that animation because it was set for four seconds, so I probably just didn't look at it long enough. This one's set to half a second with the milliseconds there being 500, so this one we should be able to see it right away when we hover. Note that MS stands for milliseconds, where a thousand milliseconds is equal to one second. Use CSS keyframes to change the background color of the button element so it becomes this color when a user hovers over it and then the keyframes. So, all right, so then if I'm not mistaken, then we're gonna, so then we're gonna do add keyframes. And then what was the background color? Is that what the name of it is? Keyframes background color. And then what, what are we doing? We're going to do it on hover. So uh, of the button. So we're going to do keyframes hover background color. And then Sorry, this one's a little confusing for me. Let's take a second here to look at it. So use the keyframe to change the background color on the button element so that it becomes this color when the user hovers on it. Um, so then I'm guessing I just have to do background uh, color. It's confusing the naming if this is actually what I'm supposed to do. And then, is that it? No, I'm not seeing anything hover here. So become... The keyframe rule should only have an entry for 100%. Oh, okay, so then I got it. Okay, since it's up, that's, that's where I got confused. So then we're just going to give this 100%. We're going to put this background color in there. The naming's throwing me off because they named this keyframe background color here. And the property I'm giving it is background color, which is kind of weird. But there you go. So now you can see the hover effect there. And then this should pass. I got stuck on that one. I don't use this stuff often, you know, and if you're new and you really never have been inside of HTML and CSS and this is all new to you, that one would have been a good one to get stuck on. Um, to be honest, I, I, I'm going to keep that in real time so you can see that I was actually stuck on it for, for a good minute or so. It happens. Don't, don't get discouraged if you get stuck.
It's normal. Hopefully these videos help you. All right, modify fill mode of an animation. That's great, but it doesn't work right yet. Notice how the animation resets after 500 milliseconds have passed, causing the button to revert back to the original color. Uh, you want the button to stay highlighted. This can be done by setting the animation fill mode property to forwards. Uh, this animation fill mode specifies a style applied to an element when the animation has finished. You can set it like so. Animation fill mode forwards. Uh, set the animation fill mode property to button hover to forwards and then the button stays highlighted when a user hovers over it. So then this is nice and easy. They're even telling us right where they want us to add this. Basically, just to pass this, you just need to copy this. So, and that should do it. There you go. Look at that. We're, we're getting there, folks. We're getting there. Uh, this is definitely one of the longer ones. I can I can I can tell that uh, this this one's gonna be one of the longer videos. I know that some I was looking at some of the uh, stuff coming up, and some of these are actually gonna be shorter than others, and some of them are gonna be longer than others. But that's just the way it is. When I get to the JavaScript one, that that one's gonna be long. I might have to break that up into two parts, or just make it like a three-hour long video. Who knows? All right, let's see. Create movement using CSS animation. Animation. When ele All right, so create movement using CSS animation. When elements have a specific position such as fixed relative, uh, the CSS offset properties right, left, top, and bottom can be used in animation rules to create movement. As shown in the example below, you can push the items downwards then upwards by setting the top property of the 50% keyframes to 50 pixels or having it set to zero for the first 0% and the last 100% keyframe. All right, so that's just basically covering what this example is saying here. Let's add horizontal motion to the div animation using the left offset property add uh, to keyframes rule. So rainbow starts at zero pixels at, uh, at 0%, moving to 25 pixels at 50, and then ends at negative 25 pixels at 100%. Do not replace the top property in the editor. The animation should have both vertical and horizontal motion. Okay, so let's see. So at 0%, we want... At 0%, we want uh, so that the rainbow starts at 0 pixels at 0%. I guess I'm confused again. Damn it. Using left. Oh, that's, that's what it is. I'm like, what, what is, what's going on here? I'm like, why am I getting so confused? So we want 0 pixels here. And then what is it? Uh, it's, it's probably starting to move now. It might not have moved yet. So then and 50%, we want it left to be 25 pixels. So we're going to do left 25 pixels. So it's probably going to start moving now. There we go. Now it's moving. Uh, and then negative uh, 25 at 100%. Uh, percent. So then left we're going to do negative 25 pixels and now it's going to probably bounce from one side and then back to where it started yeah there you go pretty cool pretty cool right all right let's run the test that should solve that and let's go to the next problem here we're getting pretty close to the end everybody uh, if you made it this far thanks for watching i hope it's been helpful um if it has been helpful make sure to hit that like button it'll help me out a lot and drop a comment if i can do anything better all right create visual direction by fading an element from left to right for this challenge you will change the opacity of an animated element so it gradually fades as it reaches the right side of the screen in the displayed animation, the round element with the gradient background moves to the right by 50 percent uh, by the 50 percent mark of the animation per the keyframe rule. Target the element with the ID ball and add opacity property and set it to 0 0.1 at 50 percent so the element fades as it moves to the right. All right, so this is nice and easy. We're going to do opacity here, opacity, and then what was it? Uh, zero. 0.1, I think that should do it. Uh, yeah, you see how it disappears as it gets to the right there, and that's it. Nice and easy. Where are we at? 85%, all right. 
I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Let's see. Uh, animate elements continually using the infinite animation count. Previous challenges covered how some of the animation properties at the keyframes rule. Uh, another animation property is the keyframe iteration count, which allows you to control how many times you would like to loop through the animation. Here's an example. Animation iteration count three. In this case, the animation will stop running after three times, but it's possible to make the animation run continuously by setting it to infinite. To keep the ball bouncing from right in a continuous loop, change the animation uh, iteration count property to infinite. So we can just take infinite right here and where's our animation count here, which is three, and then we set that to infinite and now it's just gonna bounce like that annoyingly forever until we leave the screen. All right, let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, make a CSS heart using an infinite anim animation count. Uh, here's one more continuous animation example with the animation iteration count property that uses the heart you designed in a previous challenge. A one second long heartbeat animation consists, consists of two animated pieces. The heart element, including the before and after pieces, are animated to change the size using the transform property and the background div is animated to change its color using the background property. Keep the heart beating by adding an inter, uh, animation iteration count property by both the back class and the heart class and setting it to infinite. Uh, the heart before and after selectors do not need any animation properties. So the back here, so it's basically, it just wants us to put animation iteration count. I'm not gonna type that long word there uh, and I'm going to copy that and then we're just going to do that and then we're going to do infinite ah. okay and then in the back and in the heart so then we can just copy this uh, copy and paste that there and now we got a infinite beating heart which uh which seems pretty cool there we go all right, what's next? Let's see, animate elements at variable rates. There are a variety of ways to alter the animation rates of similarly animated elements. So far, this has been achieved by applying an animation iteration count property and setting the keyframe rules. Uh, to illustrate, the animation to the right consists of two stars that each decrease in size and opacity at the 20% mark in the keyframe rule, which creates a twinkle animation. You can change the keyframes uh, rule for one of the elements so the star twinkles at different rates. Alter the animation rate for the element of the class star one by changing its keyframe rule at 50%. To 50%, okay. So and then we'll just change this to 50. That's all it wants us to do there. And now you can see they twinkle at different times and that's it, that was easy. It's, there's also a weird flicker going on there. I'm not sure why, why it's doing that. Might've been because I was updating it and it was, it was just a pause in the code editor and refreshing the auto reload there. Animate multiple elements at variable rates. In the previous challenge, you changed the animation rate for two similarly animated elements by altering their keyframes rate. Uh, you can achieve the same goal by manipulating the animation duration of multiple elements. In the animation running in the code editor, there are three stars in the sky that twinkle at the same rate on a continuous loop. To make them twinkle at different rates, you can set the animation duration property to different values for each element. Set the animation duration of the elements uh, with the class one, a star one and star two and star three to one second, 0.9 seconds and 1.1 seconds. So it seems like, so it wants this one to stay the same. We're gonna change this one to 0.9. And then we're gonna change this one to 0.1. And now you can see that they all kind of twinkle at a different time, which is kind of cool. Like I said, you can do a lot of cool stuff with CSS. And if you get really, really good at CSS, you you can become high demand. Someone who's really good at CSS can can get paid top dollar because the people want good UI developers and, and you can make some good money with just HTML and CSS. I have a video that I talk about it. I HTML and CSS has got me this far in development and and now I'm kind of ready to to you know move on from it. But it's still it's still lucrative and it's still valuable and it's good to know. And if you get really good at it, you can make yourself very marketable. So with that said, let's change animation timing with 
keywords. Uh, in CSS animations, the animation timing function property controls how quickly an animated element changes over the duration of an animation. Uh, if the animation is a car moving from point A to point B, it is given a time, your animation duration. The animation timing function says how the car accelerates and decelerates over the course of the drive. There are a number of predefined keywords available for popular options. For example, the default value is ease, which starts slow and then speeds up in the middle and then slows down again at the end. Other options include ease out, which is a quick, which is quick in the beginning and then slows down uh, ease in, which is slow in the beginning and then speeds up at the end, or linear, which applies constant animation spe speed throughout. For the example of the ball with ball ID 1 and ball 2, an animation timing function property to add an animation timing uh, property function to each and set ball 1 to linear and ball 2 to ease. So we're going to we're going to add this this property here. I'm not going to type this stuff out. It's it's just I type slow and you guys don't want to see me type this stuff. You can just copy this. You can I I've already mentioned that you don't need to memorize this stuff, but if you want to write this stuff out if it makes you feel like you'll retain it a little bit more, I understand because it, you know, it it probably will help you remember some of that stuff. So let me, uh, and then what it wanted that one, the linear and it wanted this one to ease out. So I, I understand, I, I get it. So now you can see how they're, this one's falling at, at a linear rate. And then this one's going ease out where it comes in fast and then slows down at the end. And then that's all we have to do there. And look at that. We're getting, we're getting close now. We're getting really close here. All right. Learn how Bezier Bezier, I think I'm saying that right. Like I said, I butcher words all the time. Learn how Bezier curves work. The last challenge introduced animation timing function property in a few keywords that change the speed of an animation over its duration. CSS offers an option uh, other than keywords that provides an even finer control over how the animation plays out through the Bezier curves. Uh, in CSS animation, Bezier curves are used as uh, with cubic Bezier and function in the shape of the curve represents how the animation plays out. The curve lines uh, on a one by one coordinate system, the X axis of the coordinate and system is the duration of the animation. Think of this as a time scale and the Y axis is the change of the animation. Cubic Bezier uh, function consists of four main points that sit on a one by one grid. P0, P1, P2, P3. P0 and P3 are set for you. They are the beginning and the end points which are always located respectively in the origins of 0, 0 and 1, 1. You set the axis values for the other two points where you place them on in the grid dictates this, and the them in the grid dictates the shape of the curve for the animation to follow. This is a mouthful. Uh, this is done in CSS by declaring the X and Y values for the P1 and P2 anchor points in the form X1, X, Y1, X2, Y2. Pulling it all together, here's an example of Bezier curve in CSS code. All right, animation timing function, cubic Bezier. Um, and there you, there you have it. So you have uh, your function and then you pass in the properties there. All right, so in the example above, the X values are equivalent to each point, uh, one by point two five equals Y1. And this looks like algebra and it's really confusing. It's probably that not, uh, not that confusing, but it is to me because I never use this stuff. I don't use CSS animations. It's not my specialty. It's not my strong suit. And this stuff is I probably know it just a little bit more than someone who doesn't know any CSS and HTML, but I never use it. So for the uh, element with the ID of ball one, change the value of the animation timing function property from linear to its equivalent cubic Bezier function value. Uh, use the point values given in the example above. So it basically just wants me to change the linear value to this. So right here, we're gonna just change that to that. Right. And it looks like it's falling at the same exact rate. <laughs> so so that, just a fancy way of doing linear with, with that 
uh, you know those properties but you could probably change it also so let's use that for to move a graphic in the previous challenge ease out uh, we discussed ease out keyword describes an animation change the speed for the first and then slows down at the end of an animation one of on the right the difference between ease out keyword and, and the blue element and the linear keyword and the red element is demonstrated similar animation progresses uh, progressions to the ease out keyword achieved by using a custom cubic bezier curve um, in general changing the p1 and the anchor points drives the creation of the different curves uh, which control how the animation progresses through time here's an example uh, animation function bezier curve zero zero point uh, or zero a point five eight and one. Remember that the Bezier curve function starts with P zero at zero zero and ends with P three at one one. In this example, the curve moves faster through the Y axis starting at zero and goes through the P one value. And uh, as a result, this can change the animation element progress. Okay, this stuff is all really confusing to me. If you want to spend a bunch of time on this, by all means, go for it. I'm just gonna pass this challenge. We're getting towards the end of the video. And I don't know this stuff well enough to explain it. And I feel like I might just confuse you more if I try to read this stuff out loud because I'm reading it and I'm listening to what I'm saying and I don't know what I'm saying. So you probably don't know what I'm saying. So let's just pass this. Uh, to see the effect of the Bezier curve in action, change the animation timing function of the element with the ID red to cubic Bezier function with uh, X1, Y1, uh, X2, Y2 values and set them to this. All right, so so which one does it want? So the red one, where's red? So red, it's already got that. So we should be able to, basically it's just telling us to copy this. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna give it this here on the red for linear and then that should do it. And now it's falling at the same rate as the ease out there. That's it. Ooh, there's one left. Let's see what the last one is. Hopefully uh, it's not as complicated as this stuff that we just went over. So, oh, they just keep adding more, more balls to the screen. I don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Let's just try to get this done. This is the last one. Let's wrap it up. Uh, make motion more natural by using a Bezier curve. In this challenge, anim uh, this challenge animates an element to replicate the movement of a ball being juggled. Uh, juggled. Prior challenges covered the linear and ease out cubic Bezier curves. However, uh, neither depicts the juggling movement accurately. You need to customize the curve for this animation timing function. Uh, automatically loops at every keyframe when the animation iteration count is set to infinite. Since there is a keyframe set rule, uh, the middle of the animation duration is at 50%, so it results in two identical, identical animation progressions at the upward and downward movement of the ball. The following Bezier curve simulates the juggling movement right here. Notice that the value of y2 is larger than one, although the cubic Bezier curve is mapped on one by one coordinate system and can only accept x values from zero to one and the y value can be set to number larger than one. This results in a bouncing movement that is ideal for simulating a, the juggling ball. So it's saying, let's see, change the value of the timing function of the element with the ID green to a cubic Bezier function with this and its respective values is this. Okay, so we're gonna just copy these values here and we're just gonna replace the properties that are in this one here. And that should do it. See, it definitely looks more natural. I believe that's the last one. That's all folks, that's all she wrote. It's over, thank goodness. This one felt extra long. I hope you stuck around this long. I hope it was helpful. I'm sorry about the last like 20 minutes of this because all of this stuff was pretty new to me and I do remember going through this now, even though it's been a really long time. I think I came back and revisited this when Free Code Camp had a big update because I wanted to see what they had to offer and I had already been working as a developer at that time. So I, I kind of sped through it and didn't pay much attention to it. Kind of like in this video, I'm, I'm speeding through it, trying to get you the results and walk through this so you can see how it's done and just help you with some of this stuff. I try to, to you know, mention things that I am familiar with. I try to talk about things that I know about, but the last, you know, 
quarter of this video was a lot of things that I know very little about. So I hope you struggled along with me. I hope you saw me get stuck a couple times and realize that I've been doing this stuff for, for four years. I am a professional web developer, whatever you want to call it, front end developer, full stack developer. I do all that stuff. I've been doing it for a long time. I'm self-taught and I still struggle with stuff. There's still things that I don't understand. There's still things that I don't know because there's so much to learn. There's so many things to understand and, and pick up when you're becoming a software developer that you're not going to retain all the knowledge that you learned throughout the years. And that's why I kept mentioning, don't bother memorizing this stuff. It's not gonna bring you extra value. It's just gonna stress you out when you're first getting started and learning how to code because there's so much stuff to learn that's impossible to memorize this stuff. So don't bother memorizing. Just Google your your questions that you have when you, when you know how to solve something. Uh, or when you don't know how to solve something, but you know what you need to find out, learning how to Google things and learning how to find the answer is critical to becoming a good software developer. So it's okay to Google stuff and it's okay to not memorize this stuff and it's okay to power through this stuff and then the real learning is gonna happen when we build the projects. And I do plan on building projects in, in this uh, playlist as I go through the responsive web design section of Free Code Camp. And I do plan on continuing through the next sections of their curriculum and moving on the JavaScript and doing all, all the, that curriculum and all the frameworks and libraries and all the stuff that they have in the JavaScript section. And I'm also planning on doing those projects as well. Again, this these are just the first videos of a big series. Uh, if there's stuff that I can do to improve these videos, if there's anything that you have that you can suggest to me to make these videos better, to make them more engaging, to make them more intuitive, to make them more beneficial for my viewers and to add more value. Let me know in the comments, make sure to like subscribe and stay tuned for the next one. I'll be moving through all the curriculum for that free code camp has to offer. And I'm not really sure when I'm going to stop. I'll probably stop when I get tired of it. Or if I see that it, people just don't really care for it any longer, it's something new that I'm doing on my channel and I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, you know, let me know. All right. With all that said, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching. And I hope this, uh, was useful to somebody. See ya.